Joining you once again from the glorious Performance Center here in Alhambra, California, where LAFC trains. It is Inside LAFC, the Max and Vince podcast with Vince LaRose, Vince LaRosa. I am Max Bretos. We have a stacked show for you. That's why we are here. We will be joined by LAFC defender Daniel Henry, Canadian international Daniel Henry, with World Cup dreams. He did play some minutes in the first game. Mm-hmm. Didn't against Portland, which we will talk about here. Didn't but need, a big didn't part need defenders as much against Portland. Didn't need defenders as much there yeah. in this case. So we're looking forward to that conversation. Yeah, it might be my first time meeting him. You got to talk to him quickly another time? or have No, you I, I, with me not yet? really. I, just a, a quick... Just a quick hello. A quick hello for those listening to the podcast. Also available on YouTube for your viewing pleasure, so check it out there. We'll also preview the Inter-Miami game a little bit, but we start, and the Daniil Henry's interview will be coming up here, obviously. Uh, we start with LAFC Portland, much anticipated game, Sunday night under the lights. That was no minor detail. Certainly people wanted to see a game in the beautiful Bank of California Stadium when those lights are on. Ending 1-1, and we will certainly talk about the injuries, big part of what happened there. But let's talk about this game because it was an important game. Round two of 34 games. It was a rivalry game. It was intense. You saw Portland team exactly as we expected. LAFC trying to crack them. Portland going, see what you could do. Mm-hmm. And they did get an equalizer. So uh, we knew it would be a little different. It would be a, a, a truer test than we saw against the Rapids. And LAFC, at the very least, walk out with a point. A goal in stoppage time by Mama Dufal. Yeah, not one for the highlight reels, but if you're if you're somebody that really likes tactics, I guess we could delve deep into the tactics because it really was a, a tactical battle, which when you play Portland, that's that's what you're going to get. They're going to come out there. They're going to press you a little bit until they get that first goal, and then they're really going to get into the tactics and really get to the nitty-gritty. They, they play a certain style, and they're very good at it. That's the thing. And we talked about this a little bit on the LFC 360 show on Monday. Uh, we had Keith Costigan on, and, and he talked about how good they were and a lot of people on that show were, or in the chat, were like, what is he watching? What is he talking about? We dominated them. And, and we had just a quick conversation. It could have been much longer about, in football, what, what does it mean to dominate a team when you have two just very diametrically opposed styles? And I don't think we dominated them per se. I thought we played well in stretches. Uh, we liked the way that they kind of came out in the, to start the second half. Then it slowed down again. And that's exactly what... Portland wants, right? They want to slow down matches. They want to make it tough. And then they want to just hit you on the break. And they're so good at that. So I think when you look at this game and you, you think who in their tactics felt more comfortable, that's how I kind of determined the game. I, I felt like Portland felt a little bit more comfortable. But to your point, and it's a great point, to get that goal at the end, it changes the entire complexion of how we're feeling, not just in that moment, but I think even this week. It would have been four straight losses to Portland, and just for the sake of the rivalry, it it takes a little bit off of it, and Portland has all the bragging rights, and they still do based on what happened a season ago. But for so much effort to put into that game uh, and LAFC banging hard, and look, who played better comes down to a style. Whose style was uh, executing it? Who executed their style better? Portland executed their thing. I would think so. They sat there, and they took away the center of the park, they said, Ellie, go out wide, see if you can beat us, and LFC weren't able to do that. But, boy, they, they put a lot of effort in there. Uh, a ton of crosses, double-digit corner kicks, 20-plus uh, shots. Six, it, I think it even ticked over to close to 70% possession, but that doesn't matter because this is Portland saying this is how we do it. Not every team in MLS plays this way, but you will see this again. But very few teams do it better than Portland, and that's why they've been to two MLS Cup Finals in the last five years or so. But let's talk about the results. Because if we're sitting here coming off a loss from Portland after all that momentum, not to mention a game which saw a couple players leave, correct? Uh, that's a real thud. That's a real thud. A- a- again, it's just one game. But, you know, momentum means a lot, and you're going on your first road trip. So uh, I, would, I-, I keep thinking to last year, and I would say this is a game that LAFC tries, doesn't equalize, or they equalize – and then Portland are able to give it win, which is they, exactly what they did a season ago. And Portland did have a chance late, you which Maxime Crapo was able to come over and deny. So n- nothing, nothing minor there. So that is growth when you look at it. It was tuck, the the Portland goal was uh, out of somewhere, not out of nowhere, but really a, a wing and a prayer. I would is that fair? 
Well, the, actual, it was the actual goal was, but for those first, the goal came in the 18th minute. Yeah. For those first 20 minutes, they were doing exactly what they wanted yeah. to do. They were doubling up on, on our wingers with a fullback and their, their wingers dropping very deep in Espria, uh, especially Espria. But they were doubling up. We were playing just a little bit slow into their hands. And then immediately, you, it was actually kind of, um, if you want to get super soccer nerdy, to see a, a guy like Espria, when he f felt that they were close to nicking the ball, the way he unmarked himself and got ready for the counterattack was actually pretty impressive. He's really good. I've been impressed because I, I really was alerted to that last season. I go, that is... A... So when we play Portland again, that's my number one mm -hmm. key, containing him on the counterattack because he can break. He's done it. He's been a really good player. He's been in MLS a long time, a Colombian, uh, but he's a specialist and he does those things very well. So that would be my, my key there. And... This was, uh, you know, LAFC, I think, some good fortune, too. Uh, I, I, I mentioned it at the half. They picked up three yellows on Portland. I go, that's a good, that's good work. Mm -hmm. And it paid off because Bravo was able to get that second yellow card and sent out. If it wasn't Bravo, Bravo, it would have been someone else. It would have been someone else. saying that that's that one was soft, it would have been someone else, yes. That's what, you should be getting that. Ben you Rankin was a very it. lucky boy to still be on the pitch Indeed. Also. We got lucky in the sense that they make a switch. Sebastian Blanco comes in. And then the red card. And if you pointed out when we were watching it, if that happened in, if, if they didn't bring in Blanco and the red card happened, they don't bring Blanco in. No. Because he's going to do what uh, he's not gonna is going. Yeah, he's not going to stretch. stretch the he's field can't. the same way Espria and Yumi Char. Yumi Char had to put in a shift at left back. Yeah. And actually did fairly well. Yeah. So I think that was a, a very key moment because Portland probably could have got a second goal if LAFC continues to push. And instead, they didn't have the players to kind of stretch that field out. So. It, it, the red card happened at a really good time. Yeah, and look, your key worries from this game are twofold. It's the big chance creation, which these might be key worries that only really pertain to Portland because of the way Portland plays and how good they are at it. Don't get us wrong. This team, this Portland team, is very good at what they do. They're about the same team that they've always been. They've had the same coach for a long time. They've just gotten better. And a lot of, uh, some people tell me, well, this is the way Seattle plays too. No, no, no. Portland is unique in the way that they do this and the way go, they go out this. And it, some people call it negative football, but they do it to a level that wins them games. Uh, and it's exciting when they get out on the break. So the two things are the chance creation and the transition defending in, in defense. I would say that early in the game, when the, those first 18 minutes, LAFC's transition defending is a little lax. And when we talk about that, you know, when you start to, for those that don't know kind of what we're talking about, when you start to think about the modern game, there's no real delineation now between offense and defense. So transition defending, I'm saying, while well, LAFC is going forward, if you're not in the play, you have to be cognizant of if the ball turns over, how close am I to, to, my man, to the nearest man near me so that I can either counter press or mark. And I felt there was too many times where they were a little bit too eager. Maybe that's, you know, it was a, it was a packed house. Uh, it was a night game. Guys were getting we're maybe... going for it. Yeah, guys were getting maybe a little bit too close to the box and weren't. They were. It's not that they were totally neglecting their offensive marking duties, but they were just the spaces were too big. And I said that at halftime. The spaces to counter press, the spaces to even pass. There were there wasn't much cohesion and connection like we saw against Colorado. And that, this is what Portland does. And then the flip side of that is, you know, when you send 40 crosses, that's not LAFC's game, and that's exactly yeah. what Portland wants for you. So that's why in the post post game press conference, post game press conference, Steve Trundle said, you know, my big talking point to the team was, we got to create better chances. And, and that was a theme from last year, and it's about combining and, you know, not going to the same well, finding other places, coming inside. Different ideas. Different ideas, which they, you, you could see that creation sometime. It eventually got back out wide, but, you know, there was turnovers because LAFC was trying to find those pockets. Mm -hmm. And you've got to appreciate the effort. Uh, something to work I on. I felt too often they were trying to find those pockets individually. Yep. And sometimes that's what it takes. I mean, honestly, against a Portland team, sometimes it does take just an indiv individual bit of brilliance. And there were a couple times, and we'll talk, I think we'll talk more about them, where Brian Rodriguez started to line up and he beat one guy at the corner of the box and you thought, oh, is this the Galaxy goal coming? Like, is it happening? I, I, and sometimes you need it. And he saw, I, you felt like he saw it too. But a lot of times in the first half, it was just, it was too forced. Like, by the time he got the ball at his feet and he was going at, you know, the, the right back, which was Van Rankin, right? Van Rankin, the right yep. back. Uh, Dairon Espria is, yep. is already there, or Yimmy Chara is already there to double up. And it's like, no, that's when you got to find some solutions or some third man runs or some, just some different ideas where you work with your teammates. You need little partnerships because, yes, we know you can beat two guys, but 
too many times you're trying to beat a guy and then we're all forward, we've made our runs, and now we're, now we're running 70 yards back towards our own goal and we're trying to put out a fire. Brian Rodriguez, to me, a, a big story here. And frustration because of the turnovers are trying to find that space. But giving you a real hard 90 minutes, assisting the goal mm -hmm. for Mama Dufal, and figuring some things out. But the effort, to me, is a huge development. He has been committed. He's been here for the whole training camp. And those things are starting to show to the point where I feel it's going to fall for him. And Portland may be not the right team to do it because – uh, he has some work to do, but the growth is good, and I know he's been much maligned, but to see him have a If you can do it against games, Portland, you can probably do it against anyone. I think this is a, a really good developing story, and, you know, Brian is, is very engaged with his teammates and his coaches, so I think it's, a, it's another positive to take out of this. Yeah, well, look, in, in the 93rd minute, he, he does finally beat his man. He gets to the byline. And sometimes you get a guy that just fires that ball so hard and maybe at a level like knee height where it's like, yeah, maybe anything can happen. But he had the composure and the, and the frame of mind to – it just he, – he fired it. But it was, it was so low to the ground, just a perfect roll. I mean, Mamadou really just had to put his – Just tap it. Just tap it in. And, and that, all of Portland deep so there was no off. I feel like that doesn't happen in years prior for him. I feel like he beats his man – and either takes a shot at the near post, which he has done at times, gets a little selfish because he goes, uh, no one else is doing it, I just got to make this happen. Or, like I said, he blazes one through there, and it's just not the right pace, not the right height. So th that's a big improvement. And, and again, he took that upon himself yes, in that game. Because, like we said, Carlos Velo was out at halftime. Chicho Rongo, maybe not his best game, especially finishing-wise. Um, so he took it upon himself. So, I th look, if we're going to slag him for things that he does, you got to give him credit for when he does good things. Yeah. A lot to take out of offensively. I know some people on Twitter were saying about the long-range efforts. We saw Chicho take one. We saw Ilya take one. Hi, hi, people, be... hi, people that come up to me at the tailgates and are on Twitter and are always like, why doesn't the team shoot from distance more? There's there you your go. game. Yeah. There's your game why you don't. And they'll and, hit one of those. And I don't think the Ilya and Chicho, had one. Chicho one don't count because that's when you actually do want to hit it. There was an opening for it. Tough. Ilya is tough because that right. ball's rolling for so long. Yeah. But you sh when you shoot from distance, especially against a Portland team, that's what, exactly what they want you to do. They're going to get so many bodies. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to hit it as hard as you can. That ball's going to ricochet a good 40 yards back the other way, and then they're, that's Seen basically it. setting Seen up their trans transition. So, Seen it happen. Look, I'm not saying never shoot from distance, but the people that say, like, I feel like they're always trying to walk it in, it's not necessarily the case. Let's talk about the injuries. Uh, the good news, Kellen Acosta, full training. Full training uh, today. He did. It looked like he mishit the ball, maybe hit his toe. He's okay. Uh, Franco Escobar, it was a calf, um, something he was dealing with beforehand. So he came out and he was a question mark even he for was this a question game. mark came up. He played and uh, we'll have some more information on him to see about his status. Obviously, everyone wants to know about Carlos Vela. Steve Gerundolo after the game said uh, it was precautionary. They took him out. He could have kept playing. Uh, obviously, with what's happened the past two years, you've got to wear gloves on all of this with regards to Carlos Vela. And it's a, a situation where it's, it's, it's still positive now. There's nothing major. He's, he's running. It's, it's a wait and see. But with his status for Miami, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's precautionary. But it's, uh, the optics are good, certainly, by a guy, someone who's, uh, who's it's still going. So we're recording this on Tuesday. The match was on Sunday. Monday was a full day off. This was the first day that all the guys were back in. Uh, getting evaluated. So that puts us in a tough place. Like you said, we can't tell you yet because this was the first day they could get fully evaluated. But to your point, we did see Carlos out there moving around. He was mobile. He didn't seem to really have any restrictions and he, he looked happy. Right. Um, I would say that's a big change from when we were here last year. The few times we got to be here last year, when he was out, we didn't see him. He was completely in the gym or completely in the training room. So what that, what that means, we don't know because the evaluation process is still going on. It's only that first day. But it, it seems to lend credence to what Steve said after the match was, well, it was precautionary. Yes, there's something. However, we're making sure it doesn't become a big something. And that says to you that no rushing him in unless he's 100% to go. Because there was times last season when it seemed like he was ready to go. Remember, he played 20 minutes and 40 minutes. It's like we're not going to throw him back in there until he's ready. By the end of the season, he was playing, came into the preseason, was ready to go here in 2022. So still to be determined on that. We'll talk a little bit about Inter. Yeah. Why would you just look away like that? You're like, oh, <laughs> Sorry, you don't like Miami? That's my hometown. No, I, I do like Miami, and I'm actually one of the few in the minority that uh, enjoys their pink kit, so I, I would hope they would wear that pink kit with our, with our beautiful black kit. 
Um, they got blasted over the weekend. They did. The reason why I did that is because we just had a talk with uh, Seth Burton from PR, and we were talking about some of the goals that were scored by Austin. And we pointed out there was a moment where Austin scored the goal, and then literally four of their players were all within a yard of the goal line, and not a single Miami player to be found. It was uh, a weird game. They were embarrassed. It was also on Sunday. It was a game prior to the LAFC mm -hmm. game. Inner Miami were embarrassed. Huge defensive mistakes. In between those mistakes, they looked pretty good. Yeah. They were connecting. You know, uh, their big name players were engaged. Uh, I like the young Ecuadorian guy who scored the goal. Is it Campana? It's uh, mm -hmm. obviously Gonzalo Higuain going 90 minutes. There's good positives there, but they got to figure something out there. Hopefully, LAFC. We'll be able Hopefully to they don't figure out this it. weekend. I mean, look, it's cliche, but there's there's like two ways this can go. Um, they got embarrassed, and they're going to get upset about it, and now they're at home, and they're going to be angry. They're going to really give it to LAFC, who's cra traveling across country. Plus, the kickoff for their clocks, uh, for their biological clocks, it's like 10.30 in the morning, which they're not used to playing games at 10.30 in the morning. Um, so they could either give them a real test or maybe this is who they are, and... and yeah, teams man. just keep running wild on them. Get a taste of the Eastern Conference, which has benefited so many teams. Austin's benefiting from it right now. So uh, this is, <laughs> Austin has enjoyed their Eastern Conference. They have swing. enjoyed Cincinnati and Inter-Miami. So why not LAFC get fat on that? Uh, team will leave Thursday and to give a chance to adapt. It is the clock. I will say, you know, thank your lucky stars. This game is being played in March and not in June, July. August may be the worst month to play in uh, Miami. It is. It's. it's it's, it's unimaginable, unimaginably hot. So there, it could be better in that sense. But that early kickoff, it's in Fort Lauderdale. And we, uh, we know a lot of traveling supporters are going to go there, have some fun. It's going to be great to hear you there. We'll be listening. The game is an early kickoff. I know we've said this before because it's going to fit in the Tu DNA Univision broadcast window. And this is obviously a big game there because you have the Miami team, the L.A. team. And Wait, it's, it's, possibility that uh, Bryce Duke could, could be coming back from injury? We might get to see that a, would be an great old to friend. See. I, I would like to see Bryce Duke play. I think um, this will be an interesting game because Miami is kind of a mix of Colorado and Portland. Yeah. Where they kind of yeah. sit back. They, they play with three in the back. Um, so there's some ideas that you can, you can derive from both these matches, and they'll have watched plenty of tape with the coaches. Uh, but I think, end of the day, it really just comes down to what Miami's mindset is. If they are gung-ho about righting the wrongs of what has happened the first two games of the season and really putting on a show for their supporters, you, you could be in some trouble. If they're going to just say, eh, it's another, it's game number three of 34, let's go out there, then I think LAFC can really feel like they should grab three points and uh, fly, back to the, fly back from the East Coast uh, happy. All in one, we should be pretty content. We'll see how it goes in Miami following Saturday, our first KCOP broadcast. Oh, LAFC Vancouver. Bredos is finally back. Get him to work. Yeah, about time. He's, and then we'll, he's going crazy. He's going stir crazy at these. At the, he's enjoying. I know he's enjoying hanging out with all of you because he did come to the tailgate. But I could tell. You could see it in your eye. You're going yeah, to. I want to go. Crazy. I want to go. I want to call some games. Uh, so that first four games, I think we can get a good idea. But so far, so good. LAFC unbeaten. Four points have allowed just the one goal, which was this overhead kick by Yimi Chada. So you can feel content. See what the injuries uh, uh, comes out this week with all of that. But LAFC certainly in a good spot for their first road trip. Well, we would say there's depth. There is depth. That's what we talked about. We should have brought that. This is what the offseason was all about. So that when these things happen, you can bring in Ryan Hollingshead for Escobar. You can bring in Mahala, who was an active body. Latif Blessing. All the guys who came off the bench. Danny Basofsky. Ishmael Tizori Shrouty has been in full training, and he's, he's definitely an option. That's, I'm actually very excited. I, I would like to see him in some kind of I, – I don't think he'll start, but I think we'll see him. And you remember last season when there was a, a couple guys unavailable for international duty, for COVID, for injuries. You look to the roster and go, what do we do? We may have to move this guy from a defender to a midfield. We may have to bring in a guy from the USL. That happened repeatedly. So far, that's not a case here. And that's a depth that very few, if any, MLS teams have. Mm -hmm. So there we go. We're going to take a quick pause. When we return, we'll be joined by Daniel Henry, Canadian international, LAFC defender, we're really excited about this. Our first introduction for, for all of you. All reports are he's a top-notch guy, and he's going to have a very busy year coming up. So we'll have that next on Inside LAFC MVP podcast. We're back here on Inside LAFC, the Max and Vince podcast. Thrilled to be joined by the newest member for LAFC, Daniil Henry. What, what was it like to, to find out? You were in Korea. You were in England. You were in Denmark. You were in MLS before playing in Canada. And then the news that you're going to come here to LAFC. Yeah, um... 
really, really trying and testing off season. Um, I made it really clear to the Korean club that um, I I wanted to be closer um, to home for various reasons. Um, I want to be playing football on a day to day basis where I felt challenged um, at a higher level. And when it came to tra training and traveling with the national team, I was putting in like 24 hour travel days and stuff and a lot of time change. So um, I wanted to come back to the MLS. Um, and when the opportunity arose here, um, I was I was thrilled first knowing that um, Max, me and Max are really good friends. So um, on and off the pitch, we've been playing for uh, many of years, uh, a long time together. So knowing he was here and then obviously playing against LAFC and knowing some of the players in the change room and what they've done this off season and you now living in LA, it's, it's perfect. You've been in LA before? Yeah, I, was, I, I came in, in June. I actually came to, um, to watch a game last year. Um, Matt got me tickets, so I know the stadium pretty well on and off the field. I've played here and got thumped and um, just watching and being in the atmosphere and seeing um, some of the supporters here, it's been amazing. What was the experience like in Korea? Like, what made you want to have that experience, and and what was it like when you were out there? It was it was it was okay. What um, it came at a time where um, I thought I did really well um, with um, Vancouver, and it didn't go as I wanted it. And um, yeah, I didn't get the the contract or or what I wanted, so I had to explore other options. Um, and at the time, um, the Korean club was going to give me everything I wanted, and as soon as I got there, COVID happened, and that that changed a lot. Um, traveling, not being able to see family or have anybody come visit, or I didn't have that real sense of home in Korea. So it's important. It's important to have. It was tough, especially when football is not going as great as you want it to go. So, yeah, I had to get used to the culture and 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 adapt to that, which was fine. But um, ultimately, the football. Um, wasn't what I wanted it to be. So I needed to change that situation. And that decision, I just want to touch on it because you mentioned it. You are in the Canadian national team, for some of our listeners or not, not only in it, but you started the last game. Uh, it was at El Salvador, correct? correct? You started the game for Canada against Mexico, a famous win for the Canadians. So you're in the mix, but you also know if you don't get games, uh, where you, you may not stand where you are. So how important in a World Cup year, and this is all new for Canadians, correct? This is going... It, you hasn't qualified officially, but heading that direction, what you have to do to make sure that when they announce that roster for Qatar, that Daniel Henry's name is in it. Yeah, definitely. Um, touching on the national team and how important that is. Um, when you talk about my role um, and, and what I bring to that team, um, none of that matters if my club situation is not right because um, this, is, this is the most important job. Um, and playing well here, doing my job here, and then going there and adding that quality to that team. Um, the national team has been a project we've been working on for many years. So, um, to finally now see what we've, it's a joy. Um, a winning team, but a team that works really, really hard. Um, a team that goes into games really, really prepared. And a team that fights for each other. So um, we've created something really nice, or a great atmosphere in the, in the, in the national teams. And it's definitely something that I want to be a part of. Um, we have three more important games, and we want to finish top of the group. <clears throat> Obviously, three wins will solidify that and p keep us in first place. So that's definitely that's important too, huh? For, yeah, yeah, first place is definitely top of Concacaf. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about your your role here. We love talking to center backs because we think that depending on the team you play in, a center back's role can change more so than almost anyone's. Midfielders always kind of do the same thing. Goal scorers got to score goals, but when you come to LAFC, uh, you really have to play a modern center back role. Was that did that entice you? Was that interesting to you? We talked with someone like uh, Sebastian Ubiaga, and he said he he loves that kind of added pressure of there's going to be moments where you just got to make a play 1v1. Yeah, um, I've, I've been a bar, uh, part of a lot of teams that defend for a lot of stretches of the games and where I've been put in a lot of 1v1 situations. Um, what was so refreshing is knowing that I'm playing with a team that is going to score goals in abundance. Um, and. I finally am a part of a team that can keep the ball and possess the ball for very long. I know I can defend. I know my quality is defending. So um, knowing that it's, it's my job is simply to defend and to organize and bring my leadership, um, it, it all made sense. So. That's a real inch. Oh, so go ahead. I was going to say, what, it, what is the, for, for a center back like yourself, what is the biggest, what's the top of mind thing for you when you know you have to defend space in behind? Space in behind is just always, first of all, just knowing who you're playing against. And knowing that when you're in possession of long sides, going 
um, those little lapses of where you, you kind of are out of the game and boom, it's a transitional moment and knowing that you should be in the right spot to, to take out dangers. That's a really unique perspective, what you said about not having to defend as much. So the Korean team, was at, was that the case? We know in the white caps you had to do it as well. Do you have to re retrain the way you pr approach it? Because obviously there's one thing about I'm defending a lot. Now I know when I have to be there in those key spots. Yeah, like um, the thing is about defenders is when you defend in repetitions um, and different situations happen, when you ha when that happens so much, it's like you you know how to go about different situations. I, I feel like for especially young defenders and then growing up, I, I think the best experiences were the ones that I had to take hard lessons and learn them. Um, and the more repetitions you get, the defending the more, a lot, yeah, or the more you know how to to handle certain situations and what is presented. Um, I understand that um, defending here. Um, Sometimes it'll be very open and you might be put in those 1v1 situations, but that's bravery. Defending is all about bravery and having having like the, the balls to, to, to be that player. Like I understand that sometimes I'm the villain, um, but I, I'm not looking to, to, to be a hero. I'm, I'm looking to help my team keep clean sheets. And, <laughs> that's great. And as soon as possible. And yeah, I know that we can definitely find goals. So just making sure that we can keep a solid, unified back line and, and just make sure that our presence is felt. What about off the pitch? How are you enjoying LA? We're starting to open up a little bit more now. Are you getting to explore the city a little bit? Is this is this your speed of city? The vibe you've now lived in a lot of different places. So I'm wondering how you're how you're finding it here. Um, I haven't done anything much. Obviously, I'm waiting for like my apartment, um, visa, everything. Kind of just going slowly, but um, I, I think that um, LA has everything. Um, I'm a big food guy. I like to. to okay. Uh, what kind of food? Um. My palate is amazing. Like I, <laughs> yeah? Yeah. yeah? My palate's yeah. amazing. You I, cook a little bit too or you just... I cook. No, no. Oh, definitely cool, cook. cool. But um, I like to try different restaurants, different cuisines. Um, so I'll probably do that and venture off and find find nice places and, and little communities to, to, to eat there. But um, no, right now I'm just focused on... I, I joined the group late. So um, I'm chasing fitness. I'm chasing, I'm chasing game time. I'm chasing catching up to speed with um, the LAFC way. So that's my first priority, um, and eventually I'll, I'll catch up on everything else outside of football. I guess food also leads into this because you obviously eat very well, you're a pro athlete, but you passed the eyeball test because we saw you and I said, you look like an NFL player. <laughs> Broad shoulder, I mean, it's, what are you, 6'2"? 6'2", six, six two, six two, yeah. 6'2", it fills it out. That's, a, that's an, an interesting perspective or a, 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 a attribute to have in games. And I remember I was watching the game in Canada-Mexico, and you were able to do that, and that was a big part of why Canada was successful physical nature of a game how does that give you an edge yeah the game is changing um well to say the least like there's there's two sides of the game the tactical side and playing pretty and but then the competitive side and i think the competitive side sometimes is more important especially to start the games because you need to set a tone and you need to make sure that you're in the game it's like you have to earn the right to play the mm -hmm. way you want to play so competing is always the first mentality, having the right mentality set for the game and then everything else falls into place. So um, for myself, knowing that I know what I bring to the game, my physical attributes, of course, but um, I think that the leadership part and just keeping everybody together and grounded, um, I think I can bring that too. I feel very small right now between no, the two of you. Well, I need to lift a little more. <laughs> I, and, and Daniel, we just were, obviously, we, we were looking forward to chatting with you and I mean, you've knocked it out of the park and being so upfront and uh, Giving us a, a look inside the games you do and, and what is, how it plays into the big team aspect. So we look forward to seeing you out there as well. Welcome to Los Angeles, and we hope to, to talk in, and we hope to see you uh, uh, up, in, up in the air on your way to Qatar, having and enjoying the World Cup experience with Canada, which I know is going to be a huge deal for you. Definitely. It's going to, it's going to be one of those um, feelings, um, especially to know how far we've been coming from um, to, to where we are now. So... Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled, I'm enjoyed, but um, work's still not done yet, and we still have three more games, so we're not looking past those. Yes, sir. Daniel Henry. And, well, and once you're up to speed, we'll get you the, those uh, restaurant recommendations. <laughs> yeah. the LFC you have a lot of options here, man. The LFC community will give you a lot of good recs. Yeah, we gave sure. him some to Ilya. We said, you got to go to Koreatown, and you got to try some Korean barbecue, and Korean, yeah. authentic Korean barbecue. Yeah, we'll we got Moon here. Well, Moon, Moon promised me he's going to take me to... You better, top spot here, you better so. hold up that He's, promise. He has a top spot? Yeah, yes. he definitely has a top <laughs> Secret. He came here and he, they, you know, he did the whole tour. Tell you what, he's not telling Max and I. <laughs> yeah. We might just pop in there from across the restaurant and give you a wave. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll let you guys know. <laughs> Good we man. appreciate you. Daniel Henry here on Inside LC, the Max and Vince podcast. Rate, review, tell a friend, subscribe. Appreciate all the kind words for everyone out there. We'll be back next week from right here at the LAFC Performance Center.
Let's go!